Great. So welcome everyone. We're just going to give it a few minutes for folks to join. It looks like we already have some attendees joining the mix. So for those of you who are on right now, you just say, Welcome to QLF's very first webinar. This is so exciting to launch this incredible series. So it looks like we have a bunch of attendees already joining and from all over the world. Great to see so many familiar faces. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Alex Morris. I am the daughter of the notorious Larry Morris. And I have been working with QLF over the past three months or so um, to get this series off the ground. So we're excited to, to launch it today. Um, I just want to mention a couple of quick things before we get started. Um, the first is that we're gonna do a, a Q&A towards the end of the episode. And um, if you have any questions just at any point over the course of the episode, just enter them in. There's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen that you should see. Um, and we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can. Um, but if we don't get to your question, then we will follow up with you after the episode. The other thing I want to mention is that some of our panelists today, and I won't name names, but I happen to be related to him, are, I would say, skilled in the art of storytelling. And sometimes that storytelling can go a little off the rails. And so what we've done is devised a system to <laughs> basically bring it back. Um, so I'm going to share the image that we're going to share. This was designed by my lovely sister, Casey. And, and I should add here that I am going to be managing the tech for this entire episode. So prepare for uh, a little bit of chaos there. But let's see if we can work this out here. So hopefully you can see a squawking puffin. So you'll know if you see this image that things have gone completely off the rails. So get excited. And now I am going to introduce our wonderful host today, QLF president, Beth Alling. Beth has been at QLF now for about 18 years and has served as the QLF president for I think nearly four of them. And, you know, I was thinking back to the fact that for nearly its 60 year history, be celebrating 60 years in next year, 2021, uh, there have been three QLF presidents, our founder, um, Bob Bryan, my father, and now the first female president, Beth Alling. And I think for me, that not only speaks to, and I think something that we all share, which is just that lifelong commitment to and passion for this organization, but it, it also, when you think about the thread that kind of unites Bob, my dad, and Beth, it's this overwhelming love of people. And I think for Beth, I mean, she has that in spades. And I think her relationships with, with really each and every one of you, and, and for so many people who are not on this call right now, um, are so incredibly important to her. And it's been a real pleasure for me to be working with her over these past few months and thinking about this series and and really thinking about what inspired it, which is that uh, desire to connect with everyone at a time that's just, it's been an obviously very challenging year for everyone. Um, and I think in the midst of a pandemic, coming together in this way is, uh, is really a great opportunity. So we really thank you all for joining us today. Um, one last thing is Beth told me that when she was first hired by my dad, he said, welcome on board and fasten your seatbelt. And she said she didn't know what he meant by that at the time, but now she has a very clear idea. And I think for anyone who's worked with my father in any capacity, you have a pretty clear idea of, of what that means. So um, with that, I'm gonna say this episode will be no different. And so fasten your seatbelts and I am going to hand it off to Beth. Um, Beth, if you don't mind turning off your camera or turning on your camera rather and unmuting yourself and we can go ahead and get started. Let's just wait a moment for Oh, here we go. There she is. So Beth, I think you're still muted now.
There we go. Okay, I'm sorry it, it wouldn't unmute me, but oh, you're uh, good now. That that would have made for a very interesting first episode. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, for your kind words and um, uh, more than 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 what I really deserve, actually. Um, as as Alex said, when I was hired, I was told to fasten my seatbelt, and I thought that. Larry thought I, I was not a responsible driver. Um, and, and I've learned a lot about what it does mean. And uh, this job has been extraordinary for me and I've been all over the world and, and the people in this organization um, uh, are, are people that I admire, respect and, and adore. And they are people from all over the world. And you'll be hearing from many of them uh, during this series. And I, I, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. When we first sent out uh, notices of the series, we thought maybe five people would join up, and five did, and those were members of the Morris family. Um, and, and now we've got well over 100 registrants representing 15 countries beyond North America. Some of those are Colombia, the Czech Republic, Egypt, the Emirates, Hungary, Israel, Jordan, Kenya, Lebanon, UK, uh, and Vietnam. So this is tremendously exciting for all of us. And I just want to show you my office. Uh, behind me, you can see the flags of, of countries that are home to many of our alumni. And when I have those flags in my office, I'm, I'm inspired every day. Uh, and, I, and I love connecting with them. So, you know today's guests are QLF President Emeritus Larry Morris and former senior Vice President Tom Horn. And um, they each have a one-line uh, resume. But don't be deceived by that because collectively between them, they share a mere 80 years of experience with QLF, quite extraordinary. Larry's been here for 45 years, 35 as president. Tom was here for 35 years. So that makes them well-preserved fossils. Now, um, more on this, this episode. We'll identify some of the defining moments of their first years as pioneers and explorers, traveling to and working in remote areas. And they are both pivotal in the organization's evolution from its roots in community service to community-based conservation. So we'll take a look back in time, back to 1975, uh, to QLF's first community-based legacy program, Living Rivers. You should all know, this is important, that Larry and Tom have no idea what my questions are, nor do I know what their answers are going to be. Hence, this should be a pretty interesting episode. So I'd like to introduce Tom Horn. Tom, could you please unmute your audio and video? I think your, your audio needs to be unmuted. Okay. I think, are you you're with us now? I uh, should be. Oh, great. Okay. It, it said the host wasn't allowing me to unmute. Glitch number two. <laughs> we'll keep We're track of the number for all glitches. kinds of glitches uh, as they present themselves. And now, Larry Morris, could you please join and unmute your audio and, and video? Okay. Um, can't quite see you. Oh. Hi, everybody. Glitch number three. <laughs> hey. It's very nice to be with everybody today. And I'm me. And we're kind of looking around for him. Who's him? Him is that old goat deadbeat, the one that they call emeritus. But he doesn't know what that word even means. So don't be deceived. I'm happy to be here because, as usual, he's a bit late. And me and him 
we form a really good team. Kind of like Bert and I, but I digress. There will be no US politics spoken today. No COVID talk today. A pesky fly as a fly here. <laughs> a it's not Beth. Beth, stop that. <laughs> Strap in. Remember, that's what you're supposed to do. So if there is a remarkable resemblance to him, I'm the better half, then that is all to the, all to the good. Now, I think, as I understand it from what Beth has said, we have 15 countries represented uh, today. Townsend, are you, are you, Townsend, are you out there? What? Oh, oh, Guinness, Guinness, are you out there? Guinness, I think we have a record here. 15 countries and 100, 100 people. So, again, it is my great pleasure to waste your time a little bit here while Kim gets here. You look awfully uncomfortable down there, so maybe it's time to join the group. What do you think? Canmore. Canmore. I, I see two cigars in the distance looking over at the three sisters in Canmore. Terrific. Now, before I get up off the floor, you've got to get up. I know you're old. Just get up. Behind me, you will see on the wall, and I want you to look very carefully if you, if you can see some of these items, many of the 15 countries are represented. Many of you here are represented. So please find yourself. Now, with that, I will bid you adieu. Adieu. We've got some francophones. I know, I know, I've never improved. I'm very sorry. I will see you later on in the program. Bye. <laughs> Will the real Larry Morris please stand up? <laughs> okay. That, that's not as easy. Me, thank you very much for, for that wonderful introduction and it's very nice to be here. And I just wanna read from a friend in Toronto. There is a fine line between a pack rat and a serious QLF historian. Look behind me. It's marvelous. And I know some of you are taking great pride and I will just move the camera a little bit. There's Hungary, a number of Mike Waters. There's the cod. Don Gibson is smiling at the paddle. I know my Vietnamese colleagues are very happy to see something on the wall that will remind them of a wonderful exchange. So I think, uh, Beth, I have the one line resume, but I can stretch it and I haven't seen the puffin. So I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, nothing changes. Um, could you tell us, um, about the puffin and how did it come to be such a part of your life? Well, it isn't exactly the puffin. It was the puppet, or unless I, my okay. old ears didn't hear it. But to explain why you saw me come into the screen, uh, Kath Blanchard and a program that you, <laughs> you will hear a tremendous amount about uh, in, a, in our next webinar. So I'm not going to uh, dwell on that now. I don't want to try to do what Kath will do better than anybody I've ever known in that regard, is to talk conservation and certainly the Marine Bird Conservation Program. But one of her staff members, Louise Labar, used theater and drama, and you can see kids in local Quebec communities uh, using this 
to convey a conservation message through a play that they developed and ran uh, to their parents and, and friends and family friends uh, on the Quebec North Shore to address issues, very serious issues that Kath will tell you about next week with seabird conservation. It was effective and you see we've used it um, subsequently. McGann Dizel in the, in the lower right hand picture uh, has continued the tradition using it in Labrador and Newfoundland. It win, it's a winner every time in, uh, in promoting the conservation messages far better than uh, than any of us can do in, in words. So that's really the connection, except for the following. One year, many years back, uh, at a holiday party, uh, Louise and QLF colleagues, we had a very large group in Ipswich to celebrate the coming holidays, decided that they were gonna surprise the older staff, yeah, we were older even back then, uh, with uh, puppets in the likeness of the senior staff. You, you saw mine, and I have, uh, I wish I had the others. Um, they were classic. I've never laughed so hard in my life, and I treasure, I treasure me, um, who has um, made several uh, cameo appearances since, but um, the same method. Uh, anyway, I'm glad you all now know me and, and him. Okay, thank you very much. Now this episode is divided into three sections and the first is about to begin. I wanna to return to QLF in the early years and these questions are really for, for you, Larry and Tom. Um, and the first is, could you describe QLF in the early years as a community service organization? Go for it. Um, you want me to take that one on? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I could go for, what, four or five hours and get an, an, a whole lot of puffins, or I can be somewhat succinct, because I think, Beth, what we are doing in this uh, short period of time is focusing sort of fast forward on the emergence of the environmental side of QLF, which began in 1975. Now, remember that QLF had started uh, in 1961. Uh, it was founded by one of the most exceptional people I've ever known, uh, uh, Bob Bryan down in the lower left. We all know him, anybody that's connected to this organization. Uh, he took his personal interests. He took a, uh, a, a position that he had had at the a, a Grenfell mission and struck out on his own, focusing on community and uh, individual leadership, uh, service, uh, scholarship, uh, or enhancing the educational opportunities for the young people there. And that, and the way he did that uh, is through uh, volunteers that came from all over North America, many from the States, many from Canada, um, our, I can see our illustrious Canadian board chairman in that picture on the lower left, Philip Nato, um, and brought them to these rural communities. Like the Peace Corps, it was a two-way uh, two learning experience, and both sides gained and both sides loved each other. At the other side, uh, it was a winning combination. Um, the come from a ways, those that were in the picture in the upper right, um, in that slide set there, uh, came home changed. Many of them are still connected to this organization, not because of anything that Bob, even Tom, or, or, or certainly me did, uh, but because of the profound experience that they had uh, living and, and working with, if you will, in those rural communities. Now we fast forward to 1975. Uh, Bob Bryan was a passionate sportsman, uh, particularly uh, fishing and to some degree waterfowl hunting. Uh, Alex, the next picture, uh, if you would be so kind. Uh, well, uh, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll stay here for a minute. Uh, the organization that 
was founded back in 1961 worked, as we all know, across an international border. What I tried to do as I was hired and, and uh, we looked at the situation from you know, 30,000, not 30,000, maybe 300 miles up, uh, is try to recognize what that the commonalities of our home base was of really New England and Eastern Canada, parts of five uh, province, all, all or parts of five provinces. You'll notice from this lithograph, uh, the consistencies as we saw them, forests, rivers, and coastline and the marine environment. And we tried to argue and actually did well enough to raise some money to do it, take away the political boundary. Now, can you go, Alex, to that next picture? Yeah, because this is what all of you knew. And what we were trying to do is superimpose that first map on this one and be able to, as a private organization, do what government could not do. And government was what the game was where we worked. Why? Because this was the uh, more disadvantaged, the lower, the lower income area of uh, certainly Canada and also uh, in the Eastern uh, US. So a lot of government programs, not so many at that time, private ones. Why? Because the money wasn't there to be able to do it that way. Bob's genius was to raise uh, the money from away, from Montreal, from Toronto, from Ottawa, from, from uh, New York, certainly, from Washington, and translate that money through those people that you saw, those willing volunteers, high school students. That was the energy. That was the engine if you will, that drove QLF. But as Bob was a sportsman, he saw something else going on, and that was the demise of one of the great sports fisheries in, uh, in North America, Eastern North America, Northeastern North America, uh, Atlantic salmon. Now, it just happens, that's my grandfather and grandmother uh, on the left uh, photograph and certainly Bob on the Quebec North Shore on the right. The thought was, as Bob and Wilfred Carter of the Atlantic Salmon Federation, then the International Atlantic Fam Salmon Association, IASF Foundation, the Inter International Atlantic Salmon Foundation, came together and decided that they would do an educational program to get each putting in the uh, half the, the, the money needed uh, and see if they could do something to help uh, conserve Atlantic salmon in their home waters. They had done a lot uh, at sea and overseas uh, where the fish live to maturity, but the problem was becoming apparent uh, back home because the fish were so vulnerable for many, many reasons. We all know what many of those are. The Living Rivers program was the result uh, thanks to a friend who was working at, at QLF at the time, Candace Cochran, many of you know her. Uh, I was recruited because of my vast knowledge of both uh, geography and species. I had never seen an Atlantic salmon uh, in, the, uh, in the scales, uh, other than what my grandfather used to send my, my mother uh, once a year after a trip to the rescue. Uh, I didn't know where New Brunswick was, except a smaller city in New Jersey. So I was perfect for the job. Um, I needed a great staff because I knew I didn't have uh, what it took to do it by myself. Now we come to the guy on the lower left of my screen, uh, Tom Horn, followed by, well, I'll tell you, Alex, if you could go back one slide, I'm sorry to do this, but we're kind of winging around here. Uh, I hope you all understand uh, that we've never done this before. Uh, this was the actual first meeting on a river called the Tavison Tack, which is where Bob Ryan wanted to run this program. It was a back and forth between Bob and Wilfred Carter who wanted to do it on the Gas Bay and one of the beautiful rivers there. Uh, Bob was, persevered and we ended up at here, the Micmac Lodge uh, on the shores of the Tavis and Tack, 
River. This was actually in May of 1975, my very, very first trip. I was flown up there to take a look. If I look a little um, shock, shell shocked, it's because I had no idea what we were going to do in about a month's time uh, from them. But Bob, we all, or many, have uh, knew him. Uh, he was not to be deterred. He knew it was going to be great. So uh, then, Alex, you can go to the next one, I think. Uh, we put a staff together. Now, this is Tom because I want him to say a few things on some of uh, his memories of this time. And I want to save a, a, another comment in just a second on some of the other folks that came that first year. I think uh, three of the five of us are on this webinar. One had a, a meeting and he was very disappointed not to be able to attend and, and one sadly is no longer uh, with us uh, in this, from this summer of 1975. Tom, wh what would you like to say? Well, um, these three images, I would say on the left, I'm giving you advice that you badly needed. <laughs> and I, I think in the middle of you, that's when after you take the advice, didn't take the advice, I would bring out that sign and say, let's try over again. Although I, I really do uh, like that shirt and hat in that uh, right hand picture. But anyway, um, I was sitting in the grad room at Cornell where Larry was a grad student and I had just started. This was in May of 75. And as Larry pointed out, he was looking for people who might be able to join him. Well, um, I was reading a comic book and Larry comes in and I knew who he was, but we hadn't really sat down, he was getting his PhD, he was in the other end of the hallway and I was just getting my master's. So I was in the other end of the hallway. Anyway, uh, so he started asking me questions about where I was from and what I was doing, what I was thinking of doing that summer. And he said, well, how would you like to go to New Brunswick? And I thought he meant New Jersey, which I wasn't that excited about. And uh, he said, no, 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 up north and we'll go. And I said, yeah, that sounds good. It sounds a lot better than going to summer school. So, uh, um, we uh, uh, made plans. We left not that long thereafter, right, Larry? Uh, we didn't Come know where we were going or um, what well, we, we knew it was going to be an adventure. And as Larry said then, as he says now, put your seatbelt on. So it was very apt and it was uh, very fortuitous for me um, for, to be able to run into Larry and have that circumstance pop into my life uh, totally unexpectedly. Nice. So, so Tom and, and Larry, um, could you uh, um, tell us more about the Living Rivers program and was that a milestone in the evolution of QLF's conservation programs? Well, it was a milestone for me, I can tell you that. Um, uh, you know, it was, uh, as I think Larry has aptly described for many people, it was a profound experience. It was uh, cross-cultural. Uh, I, was, I was like a sponge. I was soaking up everything from uh, in terms of what I was asked to do, uh, uh, environmental educator in that circumstance, and what we learned from being able to travel around the province and meet people from all uh, aspects of life, um, and the enthusiasm that was part of the whole endeavor. I mean, it was just great. It was very... Um, uh, yeah. Might, might you describe uh, where did these, these really turned on kids come from? How, how did we get people to come to a program in a place neither one of us had ever seen until we well, got there? Uh, on our travel to Tavis and Tech, uh, we had to, Larry said, well, we got to keep going. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. It's a long drive. So we get to Vanceboro, Maine, which is on the border and where QLF had had some prior community service projects. And sure enough, there was a crowd there waiting for us to arrive, which I don't think we realized. So we go right into a meeting with town folk and introduce ourselves. And as you can already tell, Larry is the Houdini of the spoken language, and he can talk his way into anything or he can talk his way out of anything. And by the end of that night, we had a number of kids from uh, uh, Vanceboro uh, excited to come and then we also did recruiting at high schools in New Brunswick. Uh, we had some uh, close contacts on the Gas Bay and so we were able to recruit some kids from 
uh, Quebec, and uh, really a good mix of, what were they, 15 to 18 year olds, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, high school kids, basically. Um, and uh, we drew them from everywhere. And uh, I don't think they knew what they were getting into. Um, so we aired that aspect of being at uh, camp for three weeks for that particular group. Good, thanks, Tom. I don't know if I missed something there, but. No, I, I would say one thing, the, um, and we're gonna speak a little bit uh, more in a second about it, but most of the sponsors for the program didn't care what these kids were learning as long as they were getting out of the community that they were in, in which they were gonna get into a lot of trouble if they stayed home. We did a lot of knocking on doors of uh, local churches. And one gentleman, I think it was the pastor of one of the churches, came up to me and said, the pr who, who just spoke to me? His name was Jim. Well, I don't really care what you're doing as long as our kids get to be with him. Uh, that, <laughs> that was Jim Gaffney. Beth, can you say something please about Jim? Sure, uh, uh, you can see Jim in the top left photo. He's the, um, the lead singer in a, in a, a band. And uh, Jim uh, died recently and he was a, a great friend of Larry's and many of us at Akuilof and many who are on this, on this uh, episode today, uh, including Jim's wife, Kathy, who is wonderful. And um, we all have great respect and admiration for Jim. Uh, and he really loved QLF. He came on many eco tours all over the world with us. He joined the uh, first Congress in, in uh, Budapest with Kathy and uh, joined the post Congress tour, both of them uh, in the Czech Republic. And they both joined us in 2016 at the second Congress in Barcelona. So uh, Jim died much, much, much too young, and uh, he's sorely missed by all of us. And Jim is next to, to Larry on the, on the right there. Thank okay. you, thank you. Sure, I just wanted to uh, ask you uh, both a, a question about um, QLF's community-based conservation uh, approach. What makes that so unique and, and so successful? Tom, however you want um, to take this. Why don't you go? Uh, it puts the ownership of the resources, so to speak, or uh, uh, in the hands of those that uh, have the closest contact with it. And it's essential that uh, to be a steward, you have to know what you're, what you're, the resource you're working with. And um, you know, we did a lot of that in rivers over the years, and uh, it, uh, it was a very effective way of not having to draw a line around it and say it's protected through some agency. It's a way of getting local people to take ownership, if you will, of the, those value, values and resources that are important to them. I mean, it's really, it's not rocket science. It's pretty straightforward. It's just easier said than done. Sure. We, we were lucky, Beth. Uh, we had the template, the platform in the Quebec Labrador Foundation. And I remember in the early days that there was this, this sort of dichotomy, different worldview between those that were representing the service side, the, what we call community service, and those who were the quote unquote scientists on the Atlantic Center for the Environment, which is what we coined the environmental programs of QLF that there was this dichotomy and only when we realized that it was us working together, pulling from both the community service roots and looking uh, at the environment that we had what was then known as uh, uh, community-based conservation and the program that we wanted. And what Tom was saying reminded me of a story, of a great friend no longer with us, uh, with the Nature, was with the Nature Conservancy for his life 
said, well, you know, I love QLF and I support QLF, but I have no idea what QLF does or, or I just see lots of very excited and enthusiastic, young, smiling faces, and they're just so compelling. And I, you know, and I know you don't know what you're doing, Morris, but we'll, we'd like to support that. Well, years later, this person came up and said, you know, I used to wonder why when we put a fence around our, our preserves, our property, sometimes literally, sometimes figuratively, that would often find bullet holes in them or other graffiti or some sort of damage. It was then that I understood what community-based uh, conservation is all about. And I think that has always resonated with me. And it was then that we started partnering with a whole lot of organizations that really didn't do what they affectionately called environmental education. We, we don't do, that's what organizations like you do. All of a sudden that became the work of everybody. And the other thing that I remember from that, and I'll, I'll just digress a little bit, so what, get the puffin ready, is the cross border. There are a lot of groups that worked exclusively in the US. There are a lot of groups that worked exclusively in Canada but there were very few groups that worked across borders and frontiers. And we were one of those that did that. And all of a sudden that was recognized and we, we sort of rode on a wave of, of uh, instant popularity without disclosing the fact that most of the time we kind of backed in. We weren't the first ones to recognize what we were doing. We were just doing it then we realized why. All right, I'm off. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for, for the uh, squawking uh, puffin. Um, I just wanted to, to ask uh, you, Larry, a question uh, and, and hope for a brief answer on environmental internships. And, and your master's thesis was on the effectiveness of environmental internships. And the, the interns, uh, now alumni, uh, thousands of them, and many are on this call, um, are really the, the heart and soul of this organization, the workforce of, of QLF. Can you uh, comment on, on how important these internships are for all QLF programs then and now? I will be uncharacteristically brief because I want to move to uh, another great program that we're talking about this morning. Uh, I had no idea what I was going to do when I got out of the military. And I did what I thought parents and others thought was appropriate, and that was head to a business degree, maybe Wall Street, who knew? In business school, within a very short order, and I mean days, I recognized that this was not the right way to go for me. I was living somebody else's life, and uh, I got out of that. Now what? Couldn't find a job, couldn't find a job until I was hired by a gentleman to be an intern in, on the coast of New Hampshire. I did that and it changed my life. And I wrote when I got to Cornell about the, um, the role of these experiential opportunity organizations might be and could be in an emerging generation of environmental leaders. Because remember, we were only four or five days four or five days, four or five years after that, uh, that 1970 uh, Earth Day. So that was why I felt so passionately about offering others what I had been offered. And it was the perfect tool uh, at QLF because remember their route was in a volunteer program. We just elevated the game age-wise and uh, took it from there. Right. I, I may need to uh, jump ahead a bit. I didn't think we could possibly fill the hour and we're doing that quickly, it seems. Um, so could you uh, both explain how did QLF evolve from, uh, from an organization that um, became focused or was focused on community-based conservation and how did it share that model worldwide? And why is that relevant today as much as it was years ago. Tom? Well, I can just throw out quickly, at least initially, is 
that the model we were working with in the Atlantic region certainly had, uh, we realized was able to be expressed from other, in other areas. Um, I remember Larry sent me on a trip to the Caribbean, to Turkos and the Caymans, uh, to look at what some of the resource issues were there. We had some contacts down there that I could, I could uh, learn from and uh, who could show me around. And it was quite evident that uh, there was, you know, it's, it, it's the marine environment. It may be conch instead of Atlantic salmon, but the issues are very similar and the circumstances are very similar. I remember in Living Rivers, we brought a person, from Turks and Caicos, was it Turks and Caicos, Larry? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was our first exchange student um, who came to Living Rivers in 76 or 70, 76, I believe. And uh, it was a real eye for him. Uh, and uh, he learned a lot about the potential for going elsewhere uh, to learn from where we're going and to share what we were learning ourselves. Right? To me, that's how it really got off the, off the starting blocks. Great. We have five minutes left before we have some Q&A, but I wanted to ask you uh, both um, some you know, personal questions. And, and looking back on your time um, at, at QLF over decades, did you ever imagine you would stick around so long? Did you ever well, imagine your resume would be one line? Well, I would just throw out to the people watching this webinar, look who I was working with. Why wouldn't you stick around? <laughs> I mean, it, it very much is, um, um, uh, not only respect, but a, a much deeper feeling than that. Not only who I was working with, but the people I was able to meet in, in the roles that I had through QLF and uh, the place that I was working in, the Atlantic region. I mean, it can't get much better than that. And Larry? Who else would have me? I was lucky to get in here because I didn't have to explain myself. Bob Bryan walked into the Yale Club in New York City and uh, basically told me that I was hired. I don't think I uttered a word. Can any of you imagine that? We were together we were for hired. a few minutes. Yeah, I know, exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I've, I mean, how, what do I say? I'm a wreck in a, in a webinar like this because my other family, <laughs> You're all out there. You're all out there. And why would I want to be anywhere else? Um, I, I think that would be it, Beth. And uh, I think Alex is showing some Fogo Island pictures. And I wish, Alex, if you could go to that first, the adventure in this job has been something incredible. And my flight at night into Beirut would be exactly a, a, a prime example of that. And Munir and Diana are on the call. Uh, we would rather be nowhere else than this organization. Now, uh, Alex, could you go back please to that slide? Because I want Tom to spend a moment here on Ocean Horizons. It's very important. Tom? Well, Ocean Horizons was a um, marine program, uh, a counterpart to Living Rivers, if you will. And it was in uh, northern North Central Newfoundland. Um, a wonderful, uh, you can see, this is when our, our initial trip out there to kind of check it out. Um, and uh, of course you can't see much in the ice and snow, but that's what we had to look at and say, okay, that looks good. We'll have a program there. Uh, the getting there was an interesting story and I'll just spend a 30 seconds on that. But we went in this otter, a nine seater otter from Gander Airport to fly out to uh, Frozen Lake in, in Fogo. And uh, I, we get out there on the tarmac we, looking to get in and the guy says, well, hey, we got 10 passengers, we only got nine seats. And he says, Joe, what do we do about that? And he said, ah, just tell them to sit on the luggage. So I get in the back of the plane sitting on the luggage, of course, and um, we're flying out and I notice there's this archway into the cockpit. There's not a door, it's just an archway. And a big sign above it says no smoking. Well, you look into the cockpit and you can see the two arms of the pilots. You can't see the rest of them because they're here. And the guy's got a cigarette, he's smoking away. So I said, oh, this is gonna be interesting. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, we, we get out to Fogo and, and the first night we, we go to somebody's house who had arranged to host us. We never knew him. Turns out he was a classmate of Bob Bryan's at Yale. 
I mean, go figure. So it, it was just an amazing uh, set of uh, circumstances that led to the development of that program in Lion's Den. You can see it there. Uh, beautiful location. Um, we ended there with help from the from people on the island, and it was just a uh, outstanding um, setting for uh, the program. And um, well, you can see Mike and uh, Vic, two guys in the lower right. You had to have big hair to get a job out there. And uh, uh, just great friends. I remember them. My only time in 30 years that I fooled Larry. They, Larry, maybe you can pick up on this, but I had Vic and uh, Mike give Larry a call. Larry? Well, I heard about this two weeks ago because I think I've done everything in my power during my life to uh, avoid the story from my memory banks. But Mike reminded me uh, a few days back that uh, Vic, the gentleman on the right, and uh, well, M Mike disavowed any connection to this story at all. He said, well, you know, I just was watching and you know, what can I say? I, I, I watched him do this and I knew it was, uh, they called me back in, I guess I was in Massachusetts. We didn't have cell phones or anything back then. Uh, and said, Larry, this is serious. Tom is in a boat in, in the harbor at Fogo and he's floating out there and he's despondent. We can't, we, we, we can't connect with him. He's not communicating it. Look at the guy on the right, everyone. Look at the picture. Vic, you're out there. You're outed here. Uh, and can you imagine being on the receiving end of that phone call? Uh, Tom is, is incommunicado and we don't know what's wrong with him. That's that story. Going to the upper left picture, those post holes, Steve Crate also on the call, he's a genius. He made the cabin that you see behind the gang at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And my wife, Tina, was there about less than a month after we were married. We went to our, on our honeymoon to Newfoundland. A month later, she's back and she's digging those post holes through rock. Her, her hands were bloody. Her, her knuckles were raw. She knew she was in for a long, a long hard pull. Anyway. Tom. Yeah, well, just as a quick aside, uh, I remember as a, a good friend of mine from college and a, and a by profession. And I said, listen, if we get you up to Newfoundland, would you be willing to build this cabin for us? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, I didn't tell him that we were going to drive up. Um, so we're driving up, we cross the border into New Brunswick. And I noticed after, you know, we've gone quite a ways, he's pouring over this map. He's just pouring. I said, Steve, what's up? He says, well, geez, I see all these exits for sortie, but I can't find it on the map. So for those of you that aren't familiar with that particular story, that New Brunswick is a bilingual province and exit sortie, same thing, but he thought it was a city. So you learn a lot just crossing the border every time. It doesn't matter in what circumstance, but um, uh, really uh, a lot of support from the communities there, a lot of support from the university. Um, uh, some support, we got a lot of, uh, uh, help from, uh, uh, the public sector as well as the private sector to do those kinds of programs. Just, Thanks. um, do you have any concluding remarks to make before we have some, a Q and A? Yeah, I do. I always have a concluding remark or some remark somewhere. And I want to get a certain, you want to know why we're here? Because you never know what's going to come around the corner. Now, we started because of uh, a, 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 a very, uh, what, what, what would we call it? Serendipitous meeting with uh, Dr. Richard Van Gelder. Uh, he was the curator of mammals at the American Museum of Natural History. His daughter eventually came to work and we're so sorry. She called up, she didn't call. She emailed from New Zealand and said, it's the middle of the night, Larry. I cannot join the call. I'll watch it when Alex sends it to me or whatever you're gonna do, put it up on the, on the website later. But he said, I can't give money to QLF, but what I can do is lead trips. Now, Beth, is it okay if I take us down that road? Sure. Down we'll the eco tour? I was willing to, um, quote unquote, raise money uh, any way that we could do it. And Dick Van Gelder was no one more knowledgeable on 
uh, thing, wildlife, Africa, or other things too. He did three or four of these. I'm not sure. Tom went on one with his uncle. Is that Tom? Is that correct? Your family? Uh, my mother and two of. Oh, oh, okay. Now, Alex, can we switch to the slide that Tom is going to um, defend himself? Oh my God. Uh, well, that was my 15 seconds of fame. Uh, that's me. And if you can't see through the shadow of her hat, that's uh, Brooke Shields. We uh, had a, prior to this, the night before they had asked, does anybody want to go on a, a morning uh, balloon ride over the Serengeti? I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. And we, we had, there were six people designed to go and they, said, they came back in later and said, oh, we, 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 can, we can only take four. So two people volunteered to drop out. And so we drive to the launch and out of the woods walks Brooke Shields and her mother. And uh, they joined our balloon flight because on another balloon, which we didn't know about, they were filming for the lifestyles of the rich and famous. So here we are floating around over the Serengeti, which was, it's another separate story. Um, and we, we landed and uh, they prepared a strawberry champagne breakfast. I mean, this is all ridiculous, right? Um, all being filmed. And uh, uh, I, of course, had this, a friend took this picture. It's, the reason we're not in the center is because her mother was right on the left. And so she bowed. I, you know, you had to talk to the photographer about that one. But anyway, I took the picture and I, I, I copy of it and I signed it. I said, you know, dear Brooke, hope you enjoyed the trip. Your friend, Tom Horn. And I put a note with it when I, I sent it off to her. Yeah, and everything through her mom and uh, who was her manager. And I put a little, an extra note in there. I said, the least you could do is send me a you know, signed photograph back. Never heard a thing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you ever see that episode of Lifestyles and Rich and Famous, you'll see me in the background. It was a great trip. Uh, the best part of that trip was the drive out to the launch site. It was about an hour to get there. We got up at 4 a.m. The eyeballs in the headlights tens of thousands of eyeballs, every different color of the rainbow. It was amazing. I'm going to just jump in here because we have a bunch of really wonderful questions and I want to give Beth a few minutes towards the end um, to have her own concluding remarks. So I am going to dive in. I actually, we have our first question from Rosemary Furphy, who many of you know well. Um, and I actually think I have a picture of Rosemary that we're going to pull up. Oops. Check for you. There we are. So Rosemary has asked, what did you learn from the first year of the Living Rivers program that inspired you to continue the program and begin the new QLF environmental programs? Tom, I'm going to put it right back on Rosemary, if, if you don't mind. And I would say that what I learned is we desperately needed women on the staff. Uh, and that sounds a little bit flip. I actually mean it uh, for reasons of education, maybe morale for the five guys that first summer that were all upriver uh, cut off. Uh, but we were told that there was no way we could have a co-ed staff. This was by our sponsoring organizations that this was um, a little too risque. And we had to do some major league lobbying in order to hire uh, our first uh, woman on staff. And quickly, that woman distinguished herself, Rosemary Furphy, by taking a bus from Kenyon College, Gambier, Ohio, all the way to Ithaca, New York, so she could interview for that job. So what did we learn? We learned we didn't know anything. And it, it, it sort of, it's the take, takes a village. And we exposed both ourselves and our participants. We were all one, high school kids, staff, and you can see it on this call. That's what makes for a great program. We did it together. And it was like nothing I had ever experienced before. Tom? Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think it was all about uh, uh, the, getting over the hurdle that uh, 
was the toughest one to get over, but the most important, and that is proving yourself as an individual to the people you're working with. And uh, uh, once you did that, it was surprising how, not surprising, it was understandable how, how uh, receptive and gracious people were to each other once they get to know who you are. So it's, it's not about what you know necessarily, it's about who you are. If you get across that hurdle, you're gonna go a long ways. Thank you. Great, I'm gonna ask one more question. Um, and thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We are gonna get back to each of you with responses, um, but we're just gonna ask one more live on the episode and then I will hand it over to Beth. Um, this is actually from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, what are some of the most important things that you've learned at QLF that you want the next generation of environmentalists to know? Well, like I just described mine. It's, it's, you know, be honest, be forthright, be, be yourself. And then environment will follow in a way. And your, your work will follow uh, accordingly. So that, in brief, that's, that's where I come from. Remember, uh, and Alex, a great question. And it sounds strange, my answer coming from me. Uh, learning to listen. We were guests. We were from away. Always, we were from away. And you know what? Those who lived there in these communities that where we worked always knew vastly more than we would ever know. And that's why I say we could bring in a lot of perspective and a lot of information and a lot of academic uh, uh, prowess from the outside. And the communities love that. And they love that particularly for their families. Remember that Jim Gaffney story. We just want our kids to be around people like that. The humility of that is overwhelming for me and always has been. So anyway, sorry about that, but it's, you can see it's, the fire is still there. And I, I've got my board chairman on the call and my now boss on the call. They can get rid of me anytime, but it won't be for lack of fire. Thanks. Thank you. That's great. And Beth, I don't know if you would like to respond to that question as well, but I'm going to hand it over to you now for closing remarks. Sure. We have uh, a few minutes left. So, so here are my uh, closing remarks. And first of all, thank you again for joining us today. It means a whole lot to us. And uh, we're thrilled that, that you are here. And moving forward, we have um, an episode every month for the next 12 months. And I assume that this will go on for, for several years because there's such great material out there. And um, QLF is, is a unique organization. Uh, for those who don't know, we have a network of 5,000 alumni, about 3,500 are uh, those who've worked in our home region and the rest are international fellows representing 75 countries. Um, they are our greatest asset. We work with our alumni on all kinds of programs and partnerships uh, and will continue to do so. Uh, even during this pandemic, the work is more remote and virtual um, because of that, of course. So we have a, a promising future and you'll hear more from those conservation leaders in the coming months. And, and I hope you uh, join us. Now for today, thank you, Alex, for hosting this and doing such a great job. And uh, thank you, Larry and Tom, for your wonderful responses. And I want to thank our staff as well. Uh, Bill Steelman, producer editor, Liza Elliott, communications manager, Kevin Porter, archival photos and films, Casey Riley, graphic design and website design. And again, a, a, a recording of this episode will be posted on our website. I hope you take a look and we're proud uh, to have you join with us in that way and connect with us uh, on, online. Um, for those who don't know yet, the next episode is November 12th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with lead guest, Dr. Kathleen Blanchard, who will cover QLF's historic marine bird conservation program 
We hope you join us. Our best to you. Have a great day.